And we are live. Welcome to Lubbock Compact Live for Wednesday, uh, May the 5th. Excuse me. We're out of April now, May the 5th. I am here. I'm Adam Hernandez, and I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Nick Bergfeld. We also have two guests with us here today. Miss Charlie Green is here with us today with the Roots Historical Arts Council. We also have uh, Mr. Josh Shankles, who is the coordinator for Lubbock Compact's Garden City Initiative. And so welcome everybody that is tuned in. Just a quick reminder, if you have questions at any time during the show, put those in the Facebook comments, or if you're in the Zoom, you can speak those or put them in the Q&A on Zoom, and we will answer those when we do the Q&A sections. And so we can go ahead and get right into the um, news updates, Nick. Yeah, two quick PSAs uh, for this week related to COVID relief. Um, so many of you might have remembered that there was a rent and mortgage assistance programs that were available to individuals um, who, who needed that type of support during COVID time. Um, the city of Lubbock actually still has financing for those programs. In fact, half of the dollars that we received from the federal government for these programs still has not been used. So if you are hurting and you are still looking for rent or mortgage assistance, please go to the city of Lubbock's community development website. Just Google Lubbock community development and you should be able to find uh, the information for that there. But please utilize that resource. Um, if, we don't lose, if we don't use it at the local level, we're, we're eventually going to lose it. And so the funding is still there. Uh, please, uh, please apply for that if it's something that applies to you. Uh, the other is that a new program just got developed uh, by the federal government, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. Now this fund is special. It's not like the payroll protection program, the PPP loan programs that you've probably heard about in the past. This program was more designed for smaller size businesses, although restaurant franchises also do count. Uh, but this program was specifically tailored for uh, service industry type businesses that struggle to have access to the PPP program. Now these, the financing you get through this program, you don't have to pay back uh, if you utilize it appropriately by the end of March of next year. Um, it's very, very favorable. Uh, the amount that you can receive as an individual business is up to $10 million. That's quite significant. And for entities that are eligible, that's restaurants, that's also food stands and food trucks, food carts, or if you run a catering business, a lot of people had a transition to that during this time. Uh, also bars and taverns and lounges, um, and then snack and non-alcoholic beverage bars. Uh, bakeries as well. And so if, if you are in that category, if you know somebody that is, please think about going after and applying to this program. It's a lot more favorable, a lot less complicated than the payroll protection one was. Not only that, but the first three weeks of this program just started on Monday. Uh, it is being set aside time for either women, veterans, or historically discriminated against uh, minority communities uh, have first priority for the first three weeks of this program. Uh, so please get your application in. Uh, make sure that you are able to have access to these great grants programs um, if you've been struggling throughout COVID time and, and need that kind of financing. Uh, to dive into some of the news, a lot of city updates. Uh, so the first one on Monday was the Comprehensive Plan Oversight Committee. Um, so this group met again. This is the committee that uh, was created as part of Twan Lub uh, Plan Lubbock 2040. The purpose of this committee is to make sure that the city of Lubbock continues to implement in a timely fashion the recommendations of the 2040 plan. And so they met to see whether or not the city is doing that with respect to the Unified Development Code, something we've talked a little bit uh, before in the past, and we'll, and we'll just dive into this a little bit. Adam, you were there at the meeting, or, or watched the meeting. Um, you know, what was your impression from this? You know, there have been some issues with staff um, and their reluctance to work with this committee in the past. How did you feel about how this meeting went? Yeah. I, ha I just have to say that it's been, this process has been really frustrating. Mm -hmm. I, I will say that. And I wish I didn't have to say that. Um, a lot of the city staff members now, by this time, I've, I've had a chance to speak with many of them and they, they all seem like perfectly nice people and all of that. Um, but we were able to get the request for qualifications through open records requests. And what that is, is the city of Lubbock sends out a request for qualifications. So they send this out to several companies who may be uh, prospective candidates to work on a certain project. In this sense, it was the UDC or the Unified Development Code. And all that really is, is taking Lubbock zoning and making a big kind of encyclopedia out of it. 
Um, and so that's that's kind of the gist of what that is. So they send out this request for qualifications and then companies respond and then they pick one out of those. So we were able to get that and the response from the company that was picked, which is called King Kendig Keast Collaborative. Um, and there is a breakdown somewhere in the communication because in the request for qualifications, it says specifically that the request is for the consultant to follow Plan Lubbock 2040 and the recommendations of Plan Lubbock 2040. And all through Plan Lubbock 2040, it says to give special consideration to East and North Lubbock, as well as Central Lubbock inside of the loop, the older areas of town. So this has kind of been a thing we've gone around and around with the city on several issues before, uh, just simply trying to make them honor what they say in Plan Lubbock 2040. The consultant responded back and said, yes, we can do this. We are going to be well-versed in Plan Lubbock 2040. We've done things just like this before in Manhattan, Kansas, in El Paso, Texas. And so there's no miscommunication about what the city was asking for. The breakdown in communication comes when the consultant gets here and they really don't focus on East, North and Central Lubbock much at all. And they have, I think it's like 85 pages on downtown, just downtown by itself. And nowhere in Plan Lubbock 2040 does it say to only focus on downtown. So it is frustrating in that way. We put together a packet for the, the committee uh, ahead of the meeting so that they could kind of know these things. We also sent them the request for qualifications and the response so that they could also reference those. Um, and so they, the, the meeting started off well, I thought, you know, they, they were asking a lot of good questions. Um, staff, you know, <laughs> was hit or miss on the responses. Uh, one of the things that was disappointing too was that at the last meeting, they, the committee made a pretty strong request for the city staff to bring them back. Well, this was embarrassing. Yeah. 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 What, what it would take, what, what would the process look like to start to remove the industrial areas from near the residential neighborhoods in East and North Lubbock? That was a specific ask that was kind of like a big deal in the meeting. So it, it, it couldn't have been missed. And they did not have any information in this meeting when they came back. Um, on that. And so we had to then again, start this conversation again, uh, the committee had to start the conversation again. And so it's been a little frustrating. Um, and, and I guess that's, that's all I'll start with, I guess, and we, we can talk about a little bit more. Yeah, I, and I agree with that. I mean, it's, it's been a frustrating process to, to sort of see this, you know, and, and just as you said, not only was this a, re, a definitive request by, and this is a citizen committee, right? So they, they are appointed citizens. They are the representatives of us. They are tasked with making sure that all the best practices that were in the 2040 plan actually get done. And, you know, as they're trying to do their job as, as citizens and being oversight, you know, oversight is in the name of this committee, um, being prohibited from doing that work. And the chair of the committee, John Zweiker, actually had to call out staff during it and previously had even said and acknowledged that in the past staff has sometimes ignored them um, or has not agreed with um, allowing them to do the work that they're supposed to be doing. Um, and so a great example is the fact that this industrial conversation around the industrial sites, it wasn't even an agenda item. And, and beyond that, city staff actually tried to then stop that conversation by requesting that the committee only talk about the agenda items that staff had prepared for them, right? And, and so this committee all of a sudden is, is just sort of being railroaded uh, by that. And so, you know, it, it, it's discouraging, but at the same time, th some of the things that were powerful about this meeting, uh, two council members attended it. This is the first time that we've seen council members actively participate in some way in this, in this meeting. And then enough of them showed interest where it, this committee meeting actually became a special city council meeting as well. So that happens when at least three council members express an interest in attending a meeting. And so, so that's to say is that council is getting more engaged in this topic, is getting more involved, uh, but it has been really on, on, the, on the shoulders of, of Adam and the Lubbock Compact here to try to bring this issue to light and to say, look, this was what everyone had agreed upon in the beginning. Um, the fact that these are conversations that we, for some reason, keep getting lost in this process, we, we can't keep doing that. And, and I'm optimistic that that uh, will be able to move forward. Um, you know, so jumping from there to next topic, 
Um, so the Charter Review Committee uh, also met uh, just earlier on today. Uh, and so this was a really important one for the Lubbock Compact because the conversation was all about what would be compensation uh, and how much would be that compensation for the city council and the mayor. And, and Adam and, and Josh, you were also able to, to listen in on this one. So if you want to weigh in too, uh, but Adam, you know, what were your impressions of, of this meeting? Yeah, another frustrating one. And, and I really hate to be that guy and have these shows where everything is, is kind of a frustrated talk. But again, we, we have had a lot of people show up to two public hearings. We have had a lot of people email comments in and the vast majority, I mean the vast majority, even when we polled people online, were for a living wage or somewhere near a living wage. And they expressed all sorts of reasons for them believing that uh, to be the best way to go forward. And so the committee, <laughs> basically started out the discussion almost on 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 a note of that they were just dismissing a living wage altogether pretty much the entire uh, committee did that um jim gomez who's representing district one did advocate for a living wage he did push back a couple times during this meeting he did what he could but you know he was outnumbered six to to one um, and, and nobody else was really pushing for a living wage outside of him. So then it, it got kicked down. Uh, they actually gave the committee, uh, I don't know how many sheets uh, of handouts. And on one part of these handouts, uh, which we have already submitted an open request for. So once we have that, we'll kind of report more on that. But from what we could gather on screen, they had a few different options of, of uh, how to increase the, the pay for the city council and mayor. Now, the one thing is, is that they were all pretty much in consensus on increasing it from what it is now. Of course, right now it's $25 per month for city council, $75 uh, per month for the mayor. So they had the examples we've given them of Laredo and other things like that. They also had an average of cities in Texas and what they they pay and then they also kind of took out the big cities from that list and averaged out what kind of the small cities pay um this practice that has gone on since this conversation started is is so frustrating to me because we're lubbock texas we're not any other city um we are out in our own area of texas right the mayor the calls us the capital of west texas right so as such, in my opinion, we should not, I mean, we can look at averages and we can, we can look at those things to get an idea of where everybody's at, but there is nothing wrong with Lubbock being an innovator or doing something different than what other cities are doing. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and I understand that a lot of folks here in Lubbock are conservative, but we've got to let go of some of that a little bit. Right. We it's it's OK. I promise you, it's OK if, if we do our own thing, if we are an innovator in, in any space, it's actually preferred in other cities. This is this is why it's so frustrating to me, because in a lot of bigger cities or, or cities kind of like Lubbock with in a position like Lubbock is, they actually embrace being innovative and embrace having their own identity and, and kind of going about things their own way. Um, and so that that's kind of frustrating. So basically the range got uh, talked about from like 6,000 a, uh, a year for the city council up to, I think it was like maybe 15 or 16,000 for city council. And then as far as for the mayor, uh, I think the maximum was like 20 or, or $30,000 a year is what they discussed. So for those of, of you listening online real quick, we could do a really quick poll for whoever's on here. The two ideas that they came up with, the one that's going to move forward, uh, as far as we can tell, is $7,000 per year for city council and $14,000 per year for the mayor. This is what it looks like is going to be their recommendation at this point. What Jim Gomez had proposed when they were discussing it uh, was $30,000 per year for the mayor and 
15,000 per year for city council. So if you're listening right now, just put real quick, would you approve of the 30,000 and 15,000 or would you approve of the 15,000 and the 7,000? Um, we're also going to go ahead and put out another poll on this and try to get as many responses as we can by the next meeting. But if those of you listening right now, if you could just put that in there, that would be great. We'll pass this information along. But yeah, it's 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 just really frustrating. And and the reasons, really quick, and I'll wrap this up, but the reasons uh, that were given against this were two, two main ones. Okay, so... Uh, one of the, one of the questions, one of the, the things is just kind of really arbitrary altogether. Um, Mike McDougal said that Houston's mayor gets paid twenty thousand dollars. Houston is such a size. Lubbock is you know two hundred thousand people, not as big as Houston. It just feels wrong to pay our mayor the same or more as Houston. I don't know what that means, um, but that that was one of the pushbacks. The really the main one. Uh, that several of the committee members and that we've heard from a lot of people, and I, I don't mean to offend anybody out there, but we've usually heard this from people who it would not affect in the slightest. And that that is that it's supposed to be about service. Heard. But service does not pay LPNL. Service does not buy groceries at the grocery store, especially if you're if you have a family. So what you are doing when you don't pay a living wage or anything close to it is you are alienating people specifically in their 30s, because if you're late 40s, 50 plus, a lot of different things have happened in your life that did not happen in your 20s and 30s yet. And so there's there's very, very low chance that you're going to get somebody that's going to be such an outlier in their 30s where they're going to be able to be in a position to actually run for and hold one of these offices. That's just the plain math of it. And so, again, this is just so frustrating for us. But if you if you do feel as strongly about this as us, please email your comments in because they're still taking comments. It's citizen comments at mylubbock.us. Just put comments for charter review committee and let them know what you are in support of. But yes, another frustrating one. Um, so we, we have lots of work to do on this one still. Yeah, and, and we'll, for, for time, we'll, we'll jump to the next topic um, in a second here. But you know, with, with this issue, I think one thing to remember now is that there are no more public hearings scheduled for this committee. Um, we can submit comments through email, but this is not, this conversation is not over. Uh, these recommendations are going to go to the city council in June, and so we're likely going to, to see if, if we can have some community input again at that stage in this process, uh, because as far as we can tell, as Adam said, uh, this is a broadly popular um, uh, issue, right? The idea of the living wage is something that is not political, based on political affiliation. Uh, many people across the city of Lubbock feel the same way on this topic, and they believe that it's time for any adult um, you know, of age in the city of Lubbock, if they have the desire and motivation and drive uh, to run for council, that they should have the opportunity to. Uh, Josh, I'll, I'll give you the first word on Capital Improvements Advisory Committee. So this is uh, the impact fee group uh, that really took up uh, essentially all, the entirety of our summer uh, in an effort to try to uh, make sure that developers in our city were paying their fair share of costs for the roads, the very expensive roads going to their neighborhoods. Uh, the recap there is that the city could have them charge or have the developers have to kick in the same amount as we do as citizens, a 50-50 split. That is the maximum amount that the city of Lubbock could do um, and something that is way more fair when it comes to the cost of these roads and the maintenance of them because this money doesn't pay for their maintenance, right? And that's where these roads become very, very expensive is over time is they're just very, very large costly projects that you have to keep paying for. Instead, we did three to one, um, where now we're paying as citizens 75 cents on the dollar for roads for developers. Uh, the city estimated that this is going to be around 11 to $12 million, essentially in public handouts to the real estate developer community every year. Um, and so this program is about to start. Uh, the Capital Improvements Advisory Committee is meeting for the first time in months on Friday uh, to begin this conversation 
and Josh, I'll, I'll just let you begin with any thoughts, you know, what do you, what would you hope to see on, on Friday or, or what is it that people should know on this? Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, you, you know, here we go again. There, here's been another very frustrating process. Uh, I, you know, I'd hasten to say that some vacancies came up on this committee and even though some of the members had pretty poor attendance records, they were renominated and appointed to this committee. So that's one right out the gate. Um, I think that this issue is, it, it has a, a degree of complexity to it that allows for, you know, people to sort of move through the weeds and, and kind of get people lost. And so when people hear impact fees, a lot of folks have like kind of an immediate reaction where it's like, oh, you know, this is going to affect me. How am I going to end up paying for this? And this is specifically not what this is, was meant to do. Um, before we get into that, can I back me up on this? If the maximum amount that could be charged for impact fees is 50% of the cost, but they discounted that down to 25%, then aren't we really going seven to one on the dollars? You know? Yeah, yeah. Like they me. chipped in one, the city chips in three, plus the other four that are the other 50%, right? So it's not even four to one, it's like seven to one. Yeah, no, that's true. If, if we're doing if we're doing ratios um, correctly, that that is, yeah, right. Right. It is, it is more like that, yeah. So the basic idea behind these, right, are that development, like building houses, is the only business in town that really costs the city money to do its business. Because the more you spread out, the more houses you build, the more roads you need to build, the more maintenance costs for roads, the more maintenance costs for all the infrastructure. So the impact fees were envisioned because the citizens who are paying for the maintenance costs and the roads and stuff should have some say in how that is all conducted. Nobody else's business costs the city money like that. And so that's why they're also set at 50%, right? Because, you know, even though I might disagree, there's a fairness argument to be made like, okay, well, you know, if you pay some upfront costs for what this is gonna cost for you to put down all these houses, then later when they're part of the tax base, you know, that, that money starts coming in another way. Okay, fair enough. I, I don't necessarily agree with all that calculation, but there's a fair argument to be made there. So what would have been fair would have been to maximally uh, implement them. And they could have had the chance to implement them in a way that would not only get that mission accomplished, but also kind of reverse some of the, the negative outcomes from this whole thing. And instead we got kind of a bum policy where the developers get a massive incentive and we're stuck holding the bill and there's no real change in the momentum that's driving the whole equation. Okay, so now I'm in the weeds, but I think it's important to sort of like set the record straight. So um, I am interested in what's gonna come out of this committee. I mean, the implementation is coming up in June and I keep hearing, I keep hearing things that are telling me that uh, a lot of developers are gonna be releasing their plans before they're subject to impact fees. And like, that was one of the principal arguments for starting off at this really small level was like, like everybody was all, oh, let's just start it just a little bit and then we'll just get a little bit of money and then, and then we can look at it. And it's like, no, they're going to provide all their plans in under the door. We're not going to see any of that money, not up front. And you guys could just got played. Yeah. I'm sorry to just put it so bluntly. I'm not practiced for the public messaging, but yeah. So I, I will be curious to see what happens in the meeting. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to how this all plays out. And I hope nobody's forgotten all the details from the first round. Yeah, and, and for those of you who have an interest in attending, this meeting is at 11.30 on Friday. Um, very curiously, will not be Zoom uh, presented. One of the first committee meetings that I've seen in quite a while that will not be done on Zoom. And they are also not allowing written public comments. One of the first committees that I've seen recently to not take public written public comments. And I will say that this committee previously did both of those things. Um, you know, it might have something to do with the fact that 
sometimes over 60 individuals submitted public comments um, on behalf of fair impact fee structures. Uh, and so, you know, if, if you do have the time, 11.30 on Friday, I understand that that'd be difficult for most, but if you do, the only way to really speak up on this issue again is to physically be present in this conference room in City Hall uh, during that meeting. So you can find that on the city's websites. Um, if you type in Lubbock City of Lubbock meetings on Google, um, you can find the calendar for this and, and the information there. So uh, that's it for, for the news of the week. Um, so. Yeah, so as we bring Ms. Shirley into our conversation, if you are enjoying listening to the show and you want to support the Compact and our work, then please consider donating to the Lubbock Compact. Each and every dollar you give goes right back into producing this show and advocating for our communities. We don't get paid at all. We do this because we care about the mission and want to make Lubbock a better place to live. So please go to lubbockcompact.com slash donate today and make your donation. We have several preset options to choose from, including custom and recurring donation amounts for your convenience. Also, anybody out there, if you are looking for a chance to get involved in the community um, or you want to help make Lubbock a better place to live, or are you just looking for a reason to get out of the house, then maybe sign up to be a volunteer with Lubbock Compact. Lubbock Compact is a nonprofit public policy think tank working to empower the Lubbock community. Volunteers can do things like help plant vegetables in community gardens with Mr. Shankles and his team, or you can write and edit news articles on our website, uh, or you can even help produce this show, Lubbock Compact Live. So if you feel moved to do that, please sign up to volunteer with us at lubbock.com slash volunteer and join us in our mission to empower the Lubbock community. Once again, that's www.lubbockcompact.com slash volunteer. And now we have our guest joining us today is Shirley Green. Shirley is the executive director for the Roots Historical Arts Council and runs the Cavell Museum of African American History. She is a Lubbock native and taught for Lubbock Independent School District for 31 years. Shirley, welcome to the show. One of my favorite people in town. Yeah, you're on mute, Miss Shirley. There you go. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hello. Um, it's awesome. a pleasure being with you all today. Yeah, it's good to have you on. And uh, so Shirley, you are the executive director of the Roots Historical Arts Council, and you also run the Cavell Museum. Could you talk a little bit about how those organizations came to be and their missions? Yes, uh, Eric Strong, who is deceased, and he was the founder of the Lubbock Roots Historical Arts Council. And, hello? You're still on, Ms. Shirley. You're still on. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, yes. <laughs> Okay, it just kind of went away. Uh, yes, Eric Strong was exec executive director for the Lubbock Roots Historical Arts Council, and it was founded in 1978, and it was uh, became dormant for quite a while until he retired from Texas Tech University, and he was the director of Upper Bound, and when he retired, he activated uh, Lubbock Roots Historical Arts Council. And uh, it was active until the time he passed away. Uh, I was his chairperson for 10 years. And when he passed away, then I inherited the responsibility of being the director. And since then, I have been pushing forward. Um, the mission uh, for Lubbock Roots Historical Arts Council is to provoke, pro promote and gather understanding of the African-American experience through the practice and appreciation of the visual and performing arts through uh, the community for the underserved community. And um, so that's what we do. We have uh, the museum, we have the Roots of Circle Arts Council Community Revitalization Center, where we have nonprofit organizations meet there. And anyone can rent the lobby if they want to have a meeting there. Uh, we also have the Booker T. Washington Community Garden. And 
Uh, we also were the only people who put on the Caprock Jazz Festival, which is coming up September 18th, 2020-21. And we have two projects pending. Uh, the Mickey Leland Memorial Plaza. And we also have the East Level Gateway project pending. Yeah, as, as our viewers can tell, uh, Ms. Green has a lot going on. I, every time I, I every time I talk to her, it's like in between me and I called yesterday, you know, that was just the case. You know, uh, Shirley, talk to us about kind of the, the vision of, of, of what you would like to see out of the organization and um, the, you know, these various projects, like what, what, what's some of your hopes for our community and our city where this is? Well, one of my number one hopes is um, to fulfill the completion of the East Lubbock Gateway project. It's an outdoor park for the community, for everyone. I think that would be fantastic. I think that would be a plus for East Lubbock. It'd be a plus for Lubbock. And we are a part of the culture district. We have the indoor culture district and the outdoor. The indoor is the museum and the outdoor is the East Lubbock community, I mean, the East Lubbock uh, Gateway Project. Uh, because you have like the depot and then you have the Cavell Museum and you, it, it would be very nice to have the, uh, the community, the East Lubbock Gateway Park. And then you go on to Canyon Lake and then you go on to the windmill. It would be fantastic to have the East Lubbock Gateway Community Project Park. But, you know, when you have small money, things move slow. I would love to see the Mickey Leland Memorial Plaza complete. I think that would be another fantastic thing. Mickey Leland was born here in Lubbock, Texas, although he was raised in Houston, Texas. But he was for an advocate for the underserved and for people who were hungry and the poor. And uh, we have recognized this and it's a very educational thing to know that he was a congressman and um, he did a lot of good things for a lot of people. So um, it would just be good to get these two projects mainly done, but we are always asking for donations. <laughs> We're writing grants and uh, I think it would be very positive. And I think the taxpayers would feel that their money is being spent on something positive in their neighborhood, other than commercial buildings always being built over there. Um, you know, something positive that the entire family can use and enjoy. Because I went to a meeting and one of the gentlemen that was there, he said, it's not fair that we have to get in our car and drive all the way across town with our family to enjoy certain recreation and recreational facilities. And that is so true. But with the East Lubbock Gateway Project, you wouldn't have to get in your car and drive all the way across town. With the Mickey Leland Plaza, you wouldn't have to get in your car and drive all the way across town. It's right there in your back door. And it's not only just for the people in East Lubbock to enjoy, it's for every, every citizen and tourists and visitors to Lubbock to enjoy. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great, uh, great project that y'all have planned. And uh, I wish we could show the people some of the uh, pictures of the that the architect has done. I know you, uh, I was recently at the meeting uh, when you were presenting to United and you, and I know you probably can't share a lot of details, but did, do you, did you get a good feeling after that meeting or are we going to need to keep looking? You know, I got a good feeling. Uh, I think they got to see the real picture and, you know, they shared and said it was good to meet face to face. And with the diagram that I did have on display, 
they got a better understanding of what we are wanting to do and the mission. Uh, I did feel good about it. Um, it's still pending. Uh, more questions to be answered. But I, I think they really understood what we are trying to do. And it was wonderful for all the people who attended that meeting to give their opinion and support the projects. And I think that was very powerful and impressive. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a really great meeting. I I, I thought that the energy was pretty good too. Um, so, Miss Shirley, they they tell me that uh, Mr. Eric Strong had a big he played a big part in your advocacy. Can you can you let the people know who was Eric Strong and kind of how did he uh, influence you throughout this this journey that you've been on? Oh yes, Eric Strong. He was a poet, an educator. He was a writer. He was a historical art activist. Uh, he was a uh, nationally known, recognized storyteller. Uh, of course, you know, he was the founder and director of the Lubbock Ridge Historical Arts Council. Eric had a big heart, and he always wanted to do something for somebody and for Lubbock. He loved Lubbock, and he loved the people here in Lubbock, and he always wanted to make it a better place. Somewhere he read in a newspaper uh, many years ago, and the people had said, Lubbock is not a place for black people to want to live in. And that stuck in his mind and he was determined that he was going to make a difference. Working with Eric, um, I worked with him at Upperbound. I was under his administration. I taught instructional technology to the Upperbound high school students for 10 years. And, um, after he retired, I continued to work with him. I was his chair person for Lubbock Groups. And he was my mentor. He taught me many things. Um, I feel by tagging along with him after he passed away, had I not, I think the organization would have been in a lot of trouble. Uh, he would always say, you need to come with me to this meeting. You need to uh, look over this. So uh, come help me work on this grant. And I always wondered, like, I'm just a chair. I'm not supposed to be doing all this. <laughs> but now I see why. You know, he, he felt someday someone else need to pass over the torch. And I'm feeling the same way. You know, I feel uh, it's good to mentor young people and let them know how the organization is ran and what needs to be done and what's important. And someday, you know, pass the torch on to someone else because there's nothing wrong with good ideas, fresh ideas, and new faces. But he was my mentor. I think about him every day, and I miss him very, very much. Yeah, I mean, even before we get to the next question, you know, I should just say, like, I, I didn't know Eric Strong, but he's he's somebody whose legacy kind of like looms large over a, a lot of things that we interact with and, and people who are important to us. Um, and uh, I, I would hasten to say that I think he would be super proud of the stewardship that you've known over all these things that kind of started with his legacy. Um, and to that end, you know, the way that we kind of got um, engaged with each other was over the Booker T. Washington Garden. So uh, tell our viewers about that space and, and kind of um, what, uh, you know, the background and, and what's going on in the, in the garden. Okay, yes. The Booker T. Washington Garden, community garden, was um, the beginning, uh, was purchased well, I wouldn't say purchased, but we, it was awarded by a grant. Eric and I wrote this grant, and we got it started, I'm saying maybe about 10 years ago, maybe. And uh, the, the purpose of the grant uh, for the garden, to get the garden, is to teach and to provide vegetables to the community and, and teach the young people what is, what is a tomato, uh, how does broccoli look? Where does broccoli come from? Uh, you know, the difference in a vegetable and a weed. And uh, it's, and also to let the community know 
that there are always fresh vegetables in the garden. You're welcome to come. You're welcome to come and network and congregate with the volunteers in the garden, or you can volunteer in the garden. You can buy a bed and help raise different vegetables in the garden. But um, it's really a wonderful thing that's going on. Um, I'm very proud to say that the garden has been active for I would say the the entire ten years that it's been um, that it, it started, and and I would like to say thank you very much to the volunteers because we all are volunteers. No one gets paid to do anything, but with the volunteers coming weekly, it has really uh, made it more progressive and more educational and more productive than. It has been, and that's the whole purpose is the garden is growing constantly and improving. Yeah, uh, some really great work going on over there, and I would encourage anybody, uh, the beds are how much, Miss Shirley, to sponsor a bed? Uh, it is $100 a year. Okay, so see, it's it's really not that bad, and, and you get to uh, put your money towards something that's good for communities um so so we know that besides also besides the 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 parks projects y'all are working on and the booker t washington garden uh you also have a couple of music and arts things coming up one of these i'm on a board uh with you and honored to serve on that with you but we'll talk about the uh cap rock jazz festival first before we get into the north by northeast so can you can you uh give a little background on the on the jazz festival when it is kind of how it came about what what people can expect this year oh yes i'm really excited uh, this year uh we're going to have the cap rock jazz concert september the 18th at the buddy holly music hall the doors will open at six o'clock to 11 o'clock p.m uh, we're going to have a special dedication to the late Mr. J.T. Braxton, uh, Tom Braxton, his son, and his band coming from Arlington, Texas, will be there. And our headliner will be Adam Holly, which is from Los Angeles. And also, we're going to have uh, Emmett Cole Trio, Bruce Harris, uh, our local Hub City band starring Joe Fee, who is on our jazz committee and he's a local musician here in Lubbock. And we're really excited about this because we are gonna be in the Buddy Holly Hall. Uh, and the sound is unbelievable. The venue is fantastic. In the past, we've had it at the Helen DeVitt Jones Auditorium of the Texas Tech. But uh, we just thought, let's try something new and see. <laughs> let's help break this beautiful building in. <laughs> So we're excited about it. Tickets will, will be going on sale soon. Uh, they will be $100. And uh, I think you'll have a wonderful time. And we're always asking for donations to help make this possible. This jazz concert is to support the museum uh, and to give out a scholarship to a senior who is graduating from high school and is majoring in music and we would like to present that to them uh, for their talents. It's called the Braxton Scholarship. That's awesome. That's that's great. Uh, get to hear some great music, support a great cause. So uh, encouraging everybody out there to keep up with the Caprock Jazz Festival. And so we, we are also working together, Ms. Shirley, on the North by Northeast uh, arts festival and just real quick for the people out there what this is going to be is it's going to be in october october 16th uh to 17th it's going to be an all-day thing uh this is based on a similar event that happens in pittsburgh called art all night and the idea behind the original art all night in pittsburgh was there was a, a neighborhood similar to east lubbock that was right up against some industrial uh zoning and some industrial buildings and things of that nature a lot of those there weren't being used and so you just kind of had this ugly architecture there uh, next to the neighborhoods and so they started doing this art all night thing every year to get the community involved in something and have visitors come in and it's really been able to um raise up that area without 
uh, any kind of gentrification going on, which is always good. Um, and so that's kind of the idea here with the North by Northeast uh, Arts Festival. Uh, we are working uh, with Grant Gerlich on this. Grant is uh, part of Texas Tech Community Outreach. And so, uh, Ms. Shirley, how do you feel about this? Uh, are you excited about it as I am? And uh, just what are your thoughts about this? I think it's a fantastic idea. I was excited to be a part of this committee and chair it. Um, I think, you know, Lubbock is beginning to be a very artsy town. You know, we have the Depot District, which is all types of art going on down there. And I think this is something good that a lot of the people here in Lubbock and surrounding towns can participate in. And lots of talent can be discovered by participating in this free event. And, um, you know, again, it, it is a 501c3, a nonprofit organization, and donations are always welcome. Uh, all the money goes into the festival, uh, and whatever's left over is seed money to start the next one. And this will be the first one in Lubbock, Texas. You know, I heard from a city councilman uh, many years ago that said uh, Austin City Limits really was, the birth of it was given here in Lubbock, Texas when uh, Stubberfield was here. But, you know, the musicians moved on down the road to Austin, Texas. So here's an opportunity for us to kind of reclaim something that we started, but we didn't get to finish. So I think that this uh, festival would be fantastic. Yeah, and a big, I'm excited. Yeah, I, I'm I'm really excited about this. From when Grant first told me about this, uh, you know, I was I was pretty much on board with it. Um, we also have some of the North Lubbock leadership is getting involved in this. A lot of people from tech. We have students from the architecture department. There's there's a lot of people involved in this thing, and and it, uh, we're we're also going to make sure that we're involving the community as much as possible um, and, and uh, making this really about the community. Um, but, but just a, a, a quick thing before Josh asks the next question for everybody out there listening at, at the uh, North by Northeast arts festival, you don't have to be a professional artist or anything like that. Anybody can submit art um, and it could be any kind of art. Uh, it could be painting. It could be sculpture. It could be whatever you do. Um, and, and, there's no uh, there's no fee or anything like that. Uh, you can just put your art in there. Only one piece per person. So just wanted to put that out there. Uh, it's pretty unique in that way. Also, uh, in in the uh, the afternoon of the first day will be dedicated to uh, children's activities. And so when they when we open up the event. Uh, you want to bring out your kids and, and uh, we'll have all kinds of fun stuff to do out there uh, for the kids. But uh, yeah, go ahead, Josh. Uh, you can go ahead with your question. No, no, no. I mean, it, it's more of a, you know, follow up on all that, you know, um, and frankly, this is this kind of overarchs our whole conversation is that for so many problems we have, like we don't need to reinvent the wheel or like come up with some radical solution. I mean, it should be something that fits the nature and character of our community, but we just need to look at best practices and do that and like follow the facts, you know, and arts is such a powerful tool in community. And, you know, maybe Nick wants to get in on this, but like arts are it's such a powerful tool for community revitalization and for bringing people into communities. Um, and, and so I, I just, see a lot of positive things here um and you know uh maybe nick wants to comment on this i sure like to hear what shirley has to say yeah i mean for for me it's you're exactly right you know the i always think about it from what what is high impact low cost you know what, what are things that you can do today that change the character and nature of an area that'll allow for a community to to feel a sense of pride uh, to create placemaking. And the arts is, is truly that place of expression because not only can you um, participate in, in showing rebirth and revitalization, but you can also show a vision of the future. Uh, one that is, is that we can all agree upon and strive for and, and, and know in our hearts that that is right. And so, 
you know, to me, it's, it is about re-envisioning uh, those industrial areas um, and, and seeing how other communities have achieved this and, and the role that the arts have played in it. Uh, it's, it's huge, you know, and, and so just for me to hear this conversation, uh, I've just been smiling this whole time and, and surely I've just loved everything that you've been saying on this, but th those are sort of my thoughts on the role of uh, arts in this conversation of, you know, the industrial sites, beautification, um, and the role that it can play. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, um, I, and, you know, this brings us all the way back to the beginning of this, where we've got these park projects that are, uh, you know, the combine uh, arts and design. And in, in so many ways, the east side of our town is the more architecturally interesting than geographically interesting part of our town. And, and so I just think that a, a, a huge synergy could be capitalized on there. Uh, you know, well, you take it, Ms. Shirley. What's your What's your take? I totally agree. I mean, we we're beginning to get a lot of art over in East Lubbock, and uh, if you notice on the side of the Cavell Museum, we have a mural which was purchased through a grant, through the uh, city grant, and we have the Trailblazers of East Lubbock uh, community painted on the side, on the south side of the Cavell Museum. Of course, you know, we have the Africa, Alfred Cavell, Billy Cavell, Theodore Fee with the Boys Club, Fee uh, Boys Club. We have Eric Strong, of course, George Woods Community Center, May Simmons Park, E.C. Struggs, T.J. Patterson. And these are people that are trailblazers and were trailblazers of the East Level community, which there are others and more. But, you know, I, when I designed that mural on the side of the museum, I wanted it to be meaningful. I wanted it to be when people come, they would recognize these people and what they have done and know the story and the story will be told what they have done and they are still doing. Uh, it's not just a mural of just people and faces. These are very meaningful, strong, powerful mentors of East Lubbock and the Lubbock community. Yeah, and uh, Miss Shirley, uh, we do have a question I'm gonna answer from Facebook really quick about the North by Northeast, and then I have a follow-up to what you were just saying. So Tasha May on Facebook says, when is the deadline for entries for the North by Northeast? Tasha, we don't have that yet. Uh, we're in still kind of early stages. But we are going to have a website with all that information and we'll make sure that we uh, hit the neighborhoods. We're actually going to have a, um, a plan to go, you know, to to get this information out to as many people as we can in the neighborhoods um, or, you know, of course, on Facebook and things of that nature. So, uh, yeah, I guess just follow along. But uh, Miss Shirley, um, the Cavell Pharmacy is is what that building started started as, and I remember the Cavell Pharmacy. Uh, my my grandma, when we were really young, and it was still open. Uh, I, I know that she uh, she she did go there from time to time, and that whole time until literally I think it was maybe last year I found out that uh, actually the Cavell Pharmacy was the first black owned pharmacy in the nation. Is that right? It it was the first, Mr. and Mrs. Cavell were the first husband and wife African-American pharmacists in the United States. Wow. In the United States. As a husband and a wife that was pharmacist and African-American. And that is very special. They stayed in that building 50 years. And then they donated it to Roots uh, when they retired from that building, it was um, 2009, and then, and well, they gave it to us in 2011, and we opened up the museum in 2015 because we had to renovate and write grants and volunteers and and all that good stuff. But uh, yeah, they were the first husband and wife African American pharmacists in the United States, so and the Cavell Museum yeah. is the only. Uh, African American Museum in West Texas. See, there you go, people out there. Uh, some some Lubbock history. Uh, another Lubbock first. Again, we should never be afraid to innovate because we've had people from here innovating 
the whole time, whether it's the Cavells or Buddy Holly in music or whatever you want to name. There's so many people, uh, Mickey Leland, uh, as Miss Shirley uh, pointed out. And if you're not familiar with who Mickey Leland was, uh, you should Google him and, and find out a little bit more about him. Uh, but yeah, we've had so many people uh, from here that, that have just done so many great things. And I thought that that was a, a great piece of history to uh, let the people know about. So, uh, well, another, go ahead. Well, if I may say, we uh, the Cavell Museum is on the First Friday Arch Trail, and we are now beginning to part- participate in the First Friday Arch Trail, and uh, which will be this coming Friday. And we do have local artists there with art uh, on display, and all the art is for sale. And we get a certain percentage from the sale that goes towards the museum to help function to help it function and sustain. And the local artists uh, this month is Tyrone Jones, Jada Taylor, mm. uh, Rexa Mosley. Oh, and uh, we do, yeah, and we also have live music. Uh, we have like the Cavell's house band. We have poet, we have open mic. Uh, we really have a good time up in there. And uh, it's free admission, donations always welcome. And the reason why we added a little music to it, because we want people to come in and really have a good time as they look at the art and remember, that's also a part of art too, music yeah. and art. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, that's this uh, Friday, come on right? Out. Is that this Friday? That's right. Okay. Exactly. Started at six o'clock from six to nine. Okay. And uh, I would also like to add that. Uh, with the North by Northeast Arts Festival and the Caprock Jazz Festival and Lubbock Blues Historical Arts Council, at any city bank, you can make a donation. Just, oh. just say the name. They got, we already got the accounts there. Yep. <laughs> and they will know where the money goes. So that would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so thank you, Ms. Shirley. But before we get out of here, we're going to let people know how can people get involved with uh, the, either the Roots Council or the museum or, uh, or, or all these things that you've got going on. Uh, how, how can people contact you guys? How can they get involved? How can they donate? We, are, we have a Facebook page. We have a web page uh, with Lubbock Roots Historical Arts Council. Uh, you can write us at P.O. Box, Lubbock Roots Historical Arts Council, P.O. Box 3671. And you can get in contact with us. That's we're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. So we're all over the social media. It's yeah. not hard to get in contact with us. But uh, I'm... I would be more than happy for you to volunteer. Oh, and also would love a volunteer. We're registered with them also. And so is North by Northeast also registered with uh, Love It Volunteer Center. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I, I had forgot about that part. So yeah, that 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 is a uh, good stuff. Oh, so when do the when do the Jazz Fest tickets go on sale? You said, Miss Shirley. They haven't gone on yet. We're still fine-tuning some things before we do that, but trust me, as soon as they go on sale, you will be the first person to know to help me broadcast it. <laughs> uh, you know, I'll do it. <laughs> okay, well, well, they can also go to the webpage of the Buddy okay. Holly Hall because it's going to be advertised on their website also. Ah, awesome, awesome. And that's, yeah. the, that's the new Buddy Holly Hall right down uh, by the post office, is that right? Yeah. Yes, right across the street from the Civic Center. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's going to be uh, exciting. I haven't been able to uh, see any of that building yet on in the inside, so that's, that's going to be real nice. Oh, oh, it's awesome. It's so awesome. You'll love it. Awesome. Well, it is 7.59. We have uh, reached our hour-long show, so thanks again to Miss Shirley Green for joining us on the show today. And well, Thank uh, you for having me. Yeah, for sure. And uh, we'll we'll have you on again uh, in the future, uh, I'm sure, talking about Caprock Jazz Festival and all kinds of fun stuff coming up. So 
anybody oh, out yeah. there yeah anybody out there that's uh listening uh and you want to keep up with policy issues in lubbock or the work that lubbock compact is doing you can do that by subscribing to our newsletter at lubbockcompact.com you can sign up to volunteer lubbockcompact.com slash volunteer or if you would like to donate, you can go to lovecompact.com slash donate. You can follow us, of course, on Facebook and Instagram. You can subscribe to the show on Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast. And if you would like a free way to help us out, you can uh, follow our YouTube channel, or excuse me, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you're feeling extra generous, you can give us a like or a comment or share the video. So, with that, we will bid everybody a good night. Thanks for tuning in.